The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, your questions take center stage. An entire show dedicated to what you want to know. Get ready for answers to some of the biggest issues on life and the afterlife, such as should I invest in companies with liberal values? What happens on Judgment Day and more? Pat Robertson returns to the studio for a supersized Q&A session featuring your voicemails on today's 700 Club. Welcome, folks. This is a program I've been looking forward to, and I'm so glad this is going to be your show because you have answered the questions. We have recorded your voicemail questions, and our dear friend uh, Wendy, by the way, is in the Ukraine covering that uh, horrible mess over there, and we're delighted to see Terry Mewson, who's an old, old friend who we, we've been together forever. <laughs> and, she, and she's here as our co host. And Terry, it's just great to see Thank you. God you. bless it's you. It's fun to be on this show. You and Wendy do such a great job well, of this. I've never I know had you're the. Gonna, you're going to wait still. But anyhow, well, let's get going. Okay, I'm ready. Our first question today comes from John, who's from Springfield, Ohio. I want to know how many times do I have to pray to be forgiven for a sin? Do I have to pray for that sin over and over and over again, or what? I just wanted to know. John, Jesus said if somebody sins against you, uh, you forgive them 60 or 70 times. But in terms of you and the Lord, the minute you honestly repent, that's all you've got to do. But you've got to be honest about it. You say, God, I have sinned. I am sorry. And you know, there has to be legitimate repentance that, that you're not going to, uh, do it again and again and again and ask him to keep on forgiving you. But do you say, I have sinned, I am sorry, please forgive me one time, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, this is Barbara Buckley. Barbara's from West Virginia. I was calling to ask, it says, turn the other cheek. You're supposed to turn the other cheek. What about protecting your family? Well, uh, it depends on what you're talking about, Barbara. It's, it's a little confusing. The idea is, Jesus said, look, if somebody hits you on the first, start another one. But you, you don't want to continue to have uh, 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 problems with other people. You don't want to start a feud, for example. You said, what about uh, uh, defending your family? Well, of course you've got to defend your family. But that's not, I don't think, included in it. You say, what about your family? Well, uh, I, I do believe the self-defense is a totally different thing. If somebody offends you, then you, you say, okay, I'm going to accept that defense and I'm going to uh, allow you to do it again. But this is different. So I, I see nothing wrong with trying to defend your family if that's what you're asking. Mm -hmm. This is Cheryl. <laughs> Cheryl lives in Skyline, Alabama. At the end of the millennium, do we go to a new earth or do we go to heaven? Um. Well, at the, I don't know about the millennium. The, the millennium means a thousand years. Millennium is, is a thousand year period. Uh, but uh, I tell you, when you die, if you're in the Lord, your spirit goes to be with him. And at the resurrection, your body comes up, is resurrected into a spiritual body. But uh, in terms, remember Jesus spoke to the thief on the cross and he said, this day you will be with me in paradise. And so th there's nothing about having to do with a millennium having to do with your personal destiny. This is Janet. Janet's coming with us today from Chesterton, Maryland. Janet? I would like for Mr. Pat Roberts to explain the anointing more clearly for me because I'm hearing different things. Anointing for the nation and anointing for the person. Could he please explain um, the anointing? Here's the idea. In the Old Testament days, they poured oil on the head of the priest, and that was the symbol of his authority, and the anointing has to do with the Holy Spirit, and the, the, the uh, oil would run down his head and down to his beard. When they, they anointed, they uh, brought in another king, they poured anointing. It has to do with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what the anointing is, and it's the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And I, I don't know of a nation having an anointing. I've never heard of that before. But the anointing is is the infusion of the Holy Spirit of God into somebody's life. That's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. This is Donna with our next question. She's from Edgewood, Pennsylvania. My question is from Genesis 32, Jacob wrestled God. I want to know how can Jacob wrestle God when they say that no one has ever seen God? So if you've never seen God, how can you wrestle him? Uh, there ain't no man that can wrestle God. God. God created everything. There was an angel, and the angel appeared to Jacob, and uh, it, it was a symbol. It wasn't God. It was an angel. And the, what Jacob was wrestling with this angel because the, he was the heel planter, the supplanter. He was the trickster, and the angel was, was trying to bring him to the point of humility. And as they wrestled, it was kind of like uh, Jacob was wrestling with himself. His own nature was coming back, and the, the angel was dealing with it. And he, 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 Jacob won that, but the angel reached out and touched his hip, and he went over there limping. So from that point, he was no longer Jacob. He was Israel. He was a prince of God. But he, he didn't wrestle God. Uh, the word Elohim can be translated God and, and, and angel, but I, I don't think uh, Elohim in the Hebrew is, is uh, this is angel, not, not, not God himself. Okay, this is Craig from Cary, North Carolina, with our next question. Craig? I have a question regarding the events in Revelation. When Jesus takes the book out of the hand of God and begins to open the seals, is there any teaching that says how much time passes on the earth between the opening of a seal and to the next seal? Could it be months, years, decades? I know that we have to wait until the man of perdition is revealed at some point. But I was wondering about the time frame between the seals. Revelation is called apocalyptic literature. It is very hard to understand. And uh, to, uh, I did a graph of that. And it's like it comes back in a circle. Instead of a, a, a timeline, this one and that one and all, it, it, it this comes back on itself. And so uh, there is no timeline that we can point to in Revelation. So there's no way you, you know, uh, there's much, much clearer op, uh, material in the Gospels where Jesus tells you this is going to happen, this is going to happen. The Apostle Paul said this is going to happen. But I, I wouldn't try to draw a timeline from Revelation. You just can't do it. This is Kimberly with the next question. And Kimberly is from Savannah, Georgia. Kimberly? I just wanted to Happy Easter, and I also wanted to ask you, what are your favorite Easter traditions to celebrate the Lord's resurrection in the Robertson family, and, and what do you like to do to share the message of the resurrection? Well, the thing that I like to do more than anything is, uh, you know, we had a staff prayer meeting uh, combined with Regent University and uh, CBN, and uh, uh, it's called Maundy Thursday. It's the day before Good Friday. And the thing that to me is the most important is we have communion together and we celebrate the Lord's death and resurrection. And that to me is the favorite thing. We had a lot of stuff that we, we did that wasn't exactly very spiritual, but you know, in the old days when we, we had uh, teenage kids and a lot of them uh, out in my garden, we, we whole lot of, had a whole lot of Easter eggs out there and we went out with baskets and picked up Easter eggs. We had some college students, and they seemed to be, have a big kick out of an Easter egg hunt. But the, the, the tradition that I like the best is the fact, and we used to play Gil Emilio's Head of Christ that was so moving. And that's, but I think that communion service to me was the most important part of it. Well, this is Sharon. Sharon's joining us from New York City, New York. Here's her question. I was wondering, when we get to heaven, will we each have our own mansion or will we be sharing mansion 
with other people that live in it with us? Sure. Uh, you know, a lot of times we, we mistranslate words of the Bible. Uh, it it in, in my father's house, there, there aren't many mansions. In my father's house, there are many uh, dwelling places. There are many rooms. <laughs> and uh, you'll have your own room. I don't know if you're going to be sharing your room with anybody else. But there are not going to be any mansions. You know, I, I've got a mansion over the hillside. It makes a nice song. But uh, the, the, that translation does not mean mansions. It means the resting dwelling places. And he, what Jesus was saying, look, there's plenty of room in heaven for you. And I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. But I, I think as spiritual beings, we don't have a house to live in. Uh, we're going to live in the glory of God. It's a totally different relationship as a spirit. Uh, we're going to be spiritual beings, not, not human beings looking for, for a big place to live in. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is Terry from Tyler, Texas. Terry? When a person passes away, do they immediately go to heaven to be with Jesus? Or do we have to wait until Jesus comes again? You know, there are a lot of people talk about soul sleep, but that's not the way the Bible's... Uh, you know, Paul said, I'm in a straight betwixt two, which is to remain in the flesh, which is needly, or to depart and be with the Lord. The thief on the cross said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Paul said, to depart and be with the Lord. There is no purgatory. There's no intermediate state. There's no slow sleep. When we go where we're in heaven, but we do wait till the resurrection. When Jesus comes back again, at that point, the spirits that we have will be reunited with a spiritual body. And Paul said, you're not sure what it's going to be like. It can, like as a grain of wheat falls in the ground and all of a sudden you've got this gorgeous stalk of wheat. So uh, we don't know what kind of body we're going to have, but it will be a resurrection. We will be like him, for we will see him as he is. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> something to look forward yeah, to. Yeah, something to look forward to. Well, this next question comes from Anna from Buffalo, New York. Anna? I'm just wondering where did Mark and Luke come from in writing one of the four Gospels? Well, uh, Luke was the beloved physician who uh, traveled with the Apostle Paul. Uh, Mark, <clears throat> John Mark uh, was mentioned in the Bible, so... <clears throat> Matthew and, 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 and uh, John were disciples, and <clears throat> Mark was a younger man, but he, he, he was uh, accompanying Peter along the way and uh, accompanying uh, uh, the other apostles for, uh, along the way. So, uh, but Luke was a physician who traveled with uh, the apostle Paul. Okay, this is Laurel, and Laurel is from Seattle, Washington. I'm wondering what you think about having investments with companies that are very liberal. Um, it's a question of, of what you're talking about. What's happening today is just shocking, the so-called woke stuff. What Disney is doing is appalling. They're, they're trying to introduce uh, the same sex stuff, this LGBTQ stuff, and it's just simply appalling that Disney that was known for everything family has gotten into that relationship. And the beautiful thing that Walt Disney founded has become a, a haven for these woke philosophies. And, uh, you know, you say, well, if you're talking about that, I think I would disinvest from it. Beyond that, you know, I, I don't know that as an investor, you, you can go behind every company. I, I don't know which companies are, quote, liberal. If they are, if they're supporting, uh, supporting liberal candidates, if they're putting their money out to support liberal candidates, I wouldn't buy their stock. But uh, most companies, they stay away from that as like the plague because they, they, they don't want to mess up their own investments. They're more concerned about making money than they are making a statement. And I mean, let's face it, investment is to earn money. It's not to, uh, they are not created to be, social instruments they're created to be instruments of of commerce to to uh, facilitate the transactions of uh, of uh, capital back and forth all right 
This is Joe. Joe's from Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania. Joe? I would just like to know what qualifies as bringing your tithes to the storehouse. I, I'm not sure what qualifies as the storehouse. Well, in the Old Testament, there was one place that was designated by God as the place of receiving the tithes. And of course, there was a temple. That was the storehouse. There was one storehouse. In my opinion today, the storehouse is the, the operation of God all over the world. There are charitable organizations. There are humanitarian organizations. There are educational organizations. And all of them are part of the family of God. And I, I think the ones that, I'm, I'm talking about the ones that are Christian, not, not just every, but the ones that are Christian. And I think any one of them is, is deserving of your, of your tithes and offerings. I, I, I just cannot buy the fact that the local church, uh, you know, uh, if you have two or three people together, you can have a, have a Baptist church. I'm a Baptist. And, uh, you, know, you don't have to have anything too special. So I don't know how, what, what, what qualifies that as being the ultimate storehouse. I think the family of God, the, the body of Christ, has now become the storehouse. Mm -hmm. okay. Lots of wonderful questions already today, but yeah. we've got round two of our special voicemail edition of the 700 Club, and it's coming up right after this. Well, before we get to your email questions, we want to congratulate Pat because recently the International Christian Visual Media Association presented you, Pat, with their Legend Award and at the NRB convention in Nashville. And the CEO, Troy Miller, described you as, quote, a true powerhouse and pioneer in Christian media for decades. So we join with all of them in con congratulating Pat on a lifetime of service and leadership I'm in media. Humble, but I give credit to God for everything. <laughs> I, I do think you hold the record. <laughs> I, I've been, there's not everybody that's been broadcasting for 60 some years. That, it's amazing, really. It, it really amazing. And so congratulations Thank to you on you. that award. Well, back to our questions. Okay, this next question in this segment comes from Jean, who is in San Antonio, Texas. I was just wondering about the Holy Spirit. When Jesus left, he told his disciples that he would be sending the Holy Spirit, which he did at Pentecost, but I don't see the Holy Spirit mentioned in the Old Testament. Could you tell me if there was a Holy Spirit active in the Old Testament? I wish you'd get my book, the latest <laughs> book that's being given as a, as a premium. It's called The Holy Spirit in You. Uh, I, I, I looked at the Old Testament in the, in the very foundation of the whole earth. Uh, the Bible says that the darkness was upon the face of the deep, and God said, let there be light. And the, 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 there you've got the Spirit of God moving on the face of the water. And the, the word uh, that in the Old Testament for God that is used, uh, not for God, that's Elohim, but the word for, for the one that is the Redeemer of, of Israel is Yahweh. And that's the Hiphil term, which means he who causes everything to be. And as I began to research about the Holy Spirit, I just believe that this God was the Holy Spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, they, you know, but you look back and the Holy Spirit came to Mary and the Holy Spirit uh, was, was there. Uh, but but the, the, when, when they got through uh, having the power of God, one of the meetings said, this is that prophesied by the prophet Joel, in the latter days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. It's all the way through the Bible. Mm -hmm. This is Glenn Pat, Glenn from Gastonia, North Carolina. And I had a question for Pat on Scripture and Luke talks about when Jesus died on the cross, he had told the thief that he would be with him in paradise. Well, in Sunday school classes and reading, uh, hearing paradise could be a dimension of hell. So I'm a little confused about that. Jesus would tell him he would be in a dimension of hell. So if you could clarify what 
It means paradise meets. Certainly doesn't mean hell. Uh, hell is Gehenna. And I, I don't think paradise in any way, shape, or form can be, that, that hell can be a, a, a subset of paradise or vice versa. I, I've never seen that before. I don't know who they're teaching uh, in Sunday school, but I've never heard that in my life. Yeah. So paradise is the place where God dwells and where the people of God dwell. And Hades is the place where the, the departed dead go. Uh, the Bible talks about hell, it talks about Gehenna, it talks about the lake of fire, but it doesn't, that's not paradise, no way, no how. <laughs> okay. yeah, I've never heard that either. I've never heard it all. Yeah. Okay, this is Christine, and she's from, I hope I say this right, Christine, Cayucos, California, Cayucos, California. I have a question for you. When I hear the words, one world order, can you explain exactly what the words one world order mean? You know, I wrote a book that was a national bestseller called The, the, the New World Order. And the, the idea is that there will be an alignment of the nations uh, to come into one world. And uh, in my opinion, this whole concept is satanic because Satan wants to control all the nations. And if, if one world, they've got one world government, they have one world system, they have one world set of, of values, and uh, then you have a dictator that imposes himself upon one world. So the idea of, of, of a one world order, but the, the, they, they, you know, there's a song that was, you know, uh, that the world would be one, and, and you know, it sounds so beautiful. And you imagine that there are no preachers, there's no heaven, no hell. You know, you imagine, uh, it sounds like such a great song and everybody sings it and they don't realize what they're singing. But there's no heaven, no hell, no preachers, uh, no, no, no nations. We don't want that, okay? This is Jeanette. Jeanette lives in Dunellen, New Jersey. I would like to know, when babies die and go to heaven, do they stay as babies or do they grow up as adults? And will they recognize their parents in heaven? What does the Bible say? You know, there's a book about that kid that died and went to heaven and he saw his little sister. I, I believe that these dead children do grow up. And I think, in a sense, there's a, an age Jesus was 30 when he began his ministry, so I would say that the old people would be, get to be like 30, and the youngsters would be, would be like 30. <laughs> you, you know, they're not going to be a lot of old, decrepit people wandering around in heaven, and they're not going to be a lot of babies. And I, I believe those babies who die uh, will, will have a life. I think, I think the, the, the Spirit of God came upon them, and they're human beings when they were born. And I believe that God's going to give them a life. But I, I can't give you a scripture for it because I, I've never seen anything. But that's my personal feeling, and I believe it's valid. This is Mary from Wyalusing, Pennsylvania. I'd like to thank you for your faithfulness to the Lord and, and for all the blessings on the 700 Club. Pat, in light of all the things that have taken place in our country in the past year, please tell me how I can pray for our leaders. Well, I think you better pray for our nation. What we've got to have is a revival. There isn't anything that's going to change this country short of a major spiritual revival. And we are going as fast as we can towards socialism. Uh, there's a uh, authoritative uh, uh, vein in the air. Uh, of, of dictatorial power, uh, the, there's a lawlessness, the spirit of lawlessness. We're doing all the things that when the Bible says God gave them up to unnatural passions, we're doing all of that, all the things that indicate God's given us up. And I think this great country is the only hope of the world. There is no other nation that can defend the weak and the helpless than the United States. And we're still the greatest nation on earth. And I think we ought to pray for our country. We ought to pray more if above everything else. We ought to say, God, please send revival. And if you're going to do revival, start it with me. And that's where you, you, you ought to pray. 
It's a good word. Oh. This is Kenneth. Kenneth lives in Hayward, California. Why are there so many denominations and you cannot find anything about denominations in the Bible? Well, I, I tell the joke about the preacher that came to lunch uh, at uh, uh, one of the parishioners' homes, and the little boy said to him, you've probably heard the story, but it's a great joke. He said, preacher, he said, what abomination do you belong to? <laughs> <laughs> I think, but look, why do we have them all? The Bible talks about eager to maintain the unity of the spirit until we come into the unity of the faith. We, you know, everybody has his own little little gimmick. You know, the, the, the way you put in your, your elders, you know, do you have a presbytery or do you have a bishop? And so that's the one form of government. Uh, do you have a pope or do you have a whole bunch of churches? Do you have a congregational system? And do you have to baptize by immersion or you baptize by sprinkling? So everybody's got their own little deal. And uh, it is necessarily bad, but it, it shows that we haven't yet come into the unity of the faith. We do have, we're eager to maintain the unity of the spirit. And all of us together, whether we're Presbyterian, Episcopal, or Methodist, Pentecostal, Church of God, whatever we are, if we love Jesus and are born again, we can, we can have unity of the faith. And that's what we ought to strive for. And then let God show us what his perfect way is of how it ought to be. If you go back to the early church, they were governed by the apostles. And they had the apostles, and they had uh, prophets, and they had teachers, and they had all these ministry offices. And I think if we go back to the New Testament uh, way of doing things, I think it'd be a blessing. Mm -hmm. all right. This is Sue, and Sue is in Lafayette, Georgia. I am wondering, how do you pray to the Holy Spirit? Well, I, I, I believe, you know, we sing that song, uh, Sweet Spirit, Dwell on Me. We, we, we actually come and, and ask the Holy Spirit to come, and I, I believe that if the Holy Spirit is welcome, uh, we, the Bible talks about grieving the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Spirit that you receive from the day of redemption. I, I think there's nothing wrong with praying to the Holy Spirit. Normally, you should pray to the Father uh, in the name of the Son, in the power of the Holy Spirit. But um, I think if, if people want to pray to the Holy Spirit, He's, he's God. I mean, the, the Trinity, and, and, and uh, He's God. The Son is God. The Father's God. And I, I don't believe that the Holy Spirit, who, who is so precious and so powerful, would mind somebody asking and especially invoking his power. This is Lorraine. Lorraine's question is coming from Belleville, Illinois. Hi, I watch your show daily. My question is, can the devil understand praying in tongues? <laughs> well, I've never seen that specific, but I, I think he can uh, regrettably read our minds. And uh, uh, he, he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. So uh, he's out there, but he's trying to insert uh, thoughts into your mind. And the biggest thing, his, his biggest trick is, is discouragement. You know, and it's always, always has God said, it's always questioning the Word of God, always questioning the goodness of God. Did God really say that? Did God really tell you you couldn't eat of that fruit? Did God really tell you you couldn't do this? Uh, you know, if you are the Son of God, God said you're the Son of God. If you really are, then jump off a building. I mean, it's always He's always questioning God. And can He read, can He listen to tongues? I, I don't question that the devil can understand. He can probably do it better than you can. All right. This is Paula. Paula's from Trout Run, Pennsylvania. My question for Pat is I'd like to know the origin of the term Easter. The word itself doesn't seem to have any connection to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paula, you're right on. It comes from Westra, which is a heathen term. Uh, it, 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 she's a, a heathen goddess. And uh, 
all this business about rabbits and, and the stuff that we have at, at, at Easter and, and, and some of the symbols. I, I wish it were not true, but uh, Easter, that, that word, uh, the, the Bible talks about the Passover, talks about the resurrection, talks about Pentecost, but doesn't use the term Easter. And Easter is, is we're talking about a pagan deity. Weren't some of those holidays actually placed where they were to counter pagan sacrificial things that were happening, like Christmas and Easter? Oh, absolutely. The, you know, well, what the Catholic Church did, it was so smart. They'd come in and they'd find some heathen custom and they would Christianize it, mm -hmm. you know, and that they would, they would absorb that into the church and say, all right, we're going to Christianize this, that, and the other. And... Uh, so the, 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 the Easter is just one of, of, of many things that they've done. You're exactly right. Well, this is Rosa with a question from Jersey City, New Jersey. My question is, what is really the difference between a pastor and an apostle? Well, a, a, a pastor is given an anointing to take care of one flock. An apostle is one who lays the foundation for a particular work. Now, I've seen some definitions say, well, they, they have to be people who've, who've seen the Lord, but I, I don't think that follows through. But they're, they, they, they're ministry offices, and uh, they're, they're uh, apostles, and they are teachers, and they are pastors, and they are evangelists, and, uh, and, of course, they're apostles and prophets. And, and there are specific offices in the church that are given by the Holy Spirit. So that's the difference. This is Jan. Jan lives in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My question is regarding Judgment Day. Does it occur when I die or at the resurrection in the end times? If God forgives and forgets my sins when I confess and repent, so are my sins still listed in the Book of Life? I'm confused. Uh as far as the east is from the west, that's how far God will take your sins from you. And I believe uh, the Bible says that uh, he that believes on him, on me, and, and, and believes on, uh, on his power shall not enter into judgment. And I think the Lord will cleanse the slate of all the sin. They won't come up in any kind of a book. It won't be remembered about you. God has the ability to forget. We can't forget, but God can, and he wipes the slate completely clean. That's the good thing about being born again. You are absolutely clean from the sin that you have committed. So, I mean, take that and, and rejoice in the fact that you are free by the power and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's paid the price. It's all under the blood. It's done. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Linda, question from Chicago, Illinois. I was raised Catholic, but turned Christian. I was born again and baptized. And I was wondering, is it a sin or is it bad to have statues of the Blessed Virgin or St. Jude or Jesus in your house? Is it wrong? Well, look, here's the deal. Uh, if you invest one of those statues with some kind of magical properties, and you think you have to pray to St. Jude or you pray to uh, one of these others, uh, then I think you're doing wrong. Uh, but I, I think in terms of, uh, of venerating people, I mean, uh, we certainly honor the Virgin Mary, but we don't think that she's the queen of heaven and all that mother of God. And I, I know I disagree with some of our Catholic friends in that particular, uh, we call them Mariology. But nevertheless, uh, we honor uh, those who are gone before, but we don't build statues of them, especially we don't think we pray to them. And uh, I think we're not supposed to have idols. And if you read back in the Old Testament, you're not supposed to create an image of, of anything, uh, and, and especially and fall down and worship it. So uh, th that... Uh, it's the question of what do you think those statues are going to do for you? I mean, if it's, uh, I, I'm honoring St. Jude, but to, to have a statue and you think, well, I'm going to go up to him and I'm going to ask him for something, he's not going to do it for you because only Jesus.
can do it. And so you, you really need to pray to him. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, great questions, everybody. Coming up, round three of our special voicemail edition of the 700 Club. Your question could be featured next, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. Well, Jean, you're up with your question from Southampton, New York. I'd like to ask Pat, who wrote the Bible, and did Jesus have any brothers or sisters? Uh, the answer to the second one is easy. He does have brothers and he had sisters, and mm -hmm. the Bible says he's brothers and sisters. So who is this guy? <laughs> uh, he's a carpenter, and his brothers and sisters are with us. So yes, he had brothers and sisters. Who wrote the Bible? <clears throat> the Bible says the, the Holy Spirit moved upon men of God through the years, and uh, it was written, <clears throat> part of it was written by Moses, part of it was written by the various prophets, and you've got uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah and all the rest of them, and most of them were the, were the prophets that the, the Spirit of God moved upon. And then you've got people who, who lived with the Lord Jesus, and they wrote part of the Gospels, and others like the Apostle Paul, uh, who wrote a great deal of the New Testament, was given revelations by God. So when it's all put together, it's a coherent book, but um, it is put together by different people, but all, in my opinion, all led by the Holy Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the Bible, uh, if I can use the term, it's Theomnustos. It's a great name, which means God breathed. The Holy Scriptures are God breathed. And so we can take it as being God's Word. And I think those who live by the Word of God are those who are, are successful and happy in life. And I, it's a good book. And I would rather have one verse of Scripture clearly understood than all the books that have been written by human beings and, yeah, forever. Mm -hmm. But the, the Word of God, Theom new stuff, God breathed, all right? Okay, this is Dee. She has a question from Virginia. I'd like to know as far as paying your tithes, I wanted to know if could I spread out my tithes to the various religious organizations that I listen to as well as my church? Oh, the answer is, of course, you could. But let me just counsel you this. Uh, if If you give... 10 bucks here and 10 bucks there. It really doesn't. It's nice, but it doesn't mean a great deal. But if you if you uh, had two or three uh, religious organizations, Christian organizations that you favored, and you you uh, put your, your money together, I think you'd be smarter. And I think that would apply to everybody in this audience. Uh, you, you need to concentrate on uh, two or three organizations or churches or whatever that you really favor and focus your, your giving in that direction. And it'll, it'll have more of an impact. It's nothing, that I, nothing the Bible says you have to do it. It's just a smart way to do it. Mm -hmm. This is Marcus. Marcus is from Newark, New Jersey. I would like to know, is the Holy Communion required to go to heaven? Uh, the Apostle Paul said not only is the Holy Communion not uh, necessary, the baptism isn't necessary either. He said, you know, that what's important is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it also said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And there's something about communion that is a tremendous blessing. And uh, uh, the Bible says if they do this unworthily, some are actually, they fall asleep. They they. They said, don't take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy fashion because some people die. So uh, that's more than an ordinance. It just makes people dead. <laughs> but I do think having communion is a blessing. I think we should not forsake the assembly of ourselves together. But uh, is it necessary to go to heaven? No. This is Nellie. Nellie's from Greensboro, North Carolina. I have a question for Pat. How do you handle a hostile and angry person without causing a lot of stress in the family or friends? Uh, you handle them by not answering. You keep your mouth shut. 
That's the way you handle somebody. They're saying nutty things, and you say, oh, that is so stupid. And all of a sudden, you've got a, a controversy. Uh, when somebody is spreading falsehood, uh, you, you can speak to it. You know, the, the Bible is it's a double thing. Answer the fool. Don't ask her, answer a fool according to his folly. And then the Bible also says, answer a fool. So if they say dumb things, you can answer some of it. But at the same time, if, if somebody is causing discord, the best thing is just to keep your mouth shut. Harder to do than to say, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wisdom. <laughs> and let, let the Lord take yes. care of, of that. All right. Okay, Frank, your question from Buffalo, New York. In the prayer of the Apostles' Creed, it says Jesus died, went to hell, then rose to heaven. I would like to know why he went to hell first before going to heaven. I haven't been able to find out the answer I'm looking for. He he died, you know. Uh, he died on the cross and and was dead, and then he rose again on the third day. So what did he do in the intervening moments? <clears throat> you have a little reference in Peter. It's very. It isn't too uh, clearly spelled out, but they said he went into hell and preached to the spirits that were captive at that point. So if you have a creed, it's that he died and he he went to hell and then he rose. Uh, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. So uh, th that's where it comes from. Uh, but, you know, uh, do we have a clear statement of everything that went on? I, I, it isn't clearly spelled out, but it's, it's, it's enough to, to think. He had to do something because he was dead. I mean, he died, uh, but he, he, he didn't r rise from the dead until on the first day of the week he rose from the grave. Mm -hmm. So... In that intervening period is what you're talking about. All right. Okay, Sam from Scottsburg, Indiana, your question. Me and my wife was just wondering about what she thought about motivational speakers preaching the Word of God. And uh, we were just interested in what she had to say about it. We love your show. We watch it every day. We've been watching for years. Love you, Pat. Thank you, uh, Sam. I, I don't know exactly what motivational there's some people giving motivational speech. Um, I think the, it, the question is, if they're motivating people to do stuff that's evil, I, I wouldn't have any part of it. But I do think that uh, these guys are, are trying to get people up and going. And, and I, I think that uh, if they can encourage you to do things, you know, there's a lot of wisdom in the world. And it isn't exclusively Christian. God is the source of all wisdom. But at the same time, he lets people who, who don't know him have wisdom. And there is wisdom in the world. And there are people who, who are speaking who do have wisdom. The question is, where are they leading you ultimately? If they're leading you ultimately away from the Lord, then don't have anything to do with them. But if they are giving you something that is according with Scripture but is sound, but it isn't necessarily biblical. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, we're going to take a sip of tea on our end. And coming up, our <laughs> final round of this special voicemail edition of the 700 Club. We'll be right back with more of your questions, so stay with us. Well, we want to give answers to some more of the questions that you've asked. And Pat, this next one comes from Nancy, who's from Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania. I was reading in Revelations, and I wondered what chapter 18 is talking about. Babylon, is that America? Or who is it? Uh, you know, Mystery Babylon, Mother of Harlots. Uh, Babylon was synonymous with evil all the way through. It, it, it was uh, sign significant in that regard. And there are a lot of people who think that, that Mystery Babylon is the United States. Um, there's one thing in the Bible that talked about the one who has made the world drunk with the wine of his fornication. Well, certainly, in addition to the wonderful things we have led the world in, we have also led the world in pornography. We've led the world in all kinds of evil. 
Well, we've led the world in, in crime, in drug addiction, and you name it. And <clears throat> so could we be Mystery Babylon? I, I, I don't know. There's some people who think so, but I mean, I, I can't say. So th there's no way I can identify something that took place in Revelation and say, well, that, that applies to America. Mm -hmm. But I do think that the idea of, 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 an or, of a nation that has made the world drunk with the wine of its fornication. It was, most of Revelation was written having to do with Rome. Rome was persecuting the Christians. And there were a number of specific persecutions that took place to the Christians. And so I think Revelation was primarily written to address the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. But could it apply as well to America? Well, I, I, you can go down the list of the, 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 what Nebuchadnezzar saw. And I think we are the fulfillment of the Roman Empire, uh, you know, that goes all the way down the line. And we, we have a lot of customs that come out of Rome. We have some counting that comes out of uh, Latin and G Greek. And uh, so there is, uh, of the great civilizations that took place, we are greater and bigger than any of them. But could we be the last great civilization? It's very possible. Okay, this is Michelle. Michelle's from Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. My question to Pat is, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, childbearing became painful. How would it have been if she hadn't sinned with women having children? You know, Party we, we can are. only, only <laughs> speculate, but uh, uh, the, 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 they were cast out of the garden and they no longer had access to the beauty of God's f fruitfulness. And uh, so when the woman gave him, herself over to Satan and accepted his, his blandishments, uh, God said, you know, you're going to bear your children in pain. So I think it was the result of the fall. If there hadn't been any fall, it wouldn't have been wonderful for all of us if Adam hadn't sinned. I mean, we would have still been living in a paradise. It would be the most wonderful thing we've ever heard of. So we're all suffering because of, of Adam. And the, the Bible tells us that he, the new Adam, Jesus Christ, died to take away the curse that was on men and women because of the fall of the original man who was Adam. So uh, I, I, I think uh, perhaps w women, uh, well, it, maybe the Lord will give them some relief, but it, it is painful for sure. And I, I haven't had any children, so Terry, <laughs> Terry can tell us about it. It is painful yeah, for sure. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I've been spared that, so thanks. Yes, yeah. I'm very grateful, but I, I can only sympathize. I've never experienced it. All right. Well, Danielle has a question from Edgewood, New Mexico. Hi, Pat. Pat, what does the Bible say about serving communion? Is it only for the members of a church, or can it be observed when small groups gather together outside the church? Thank you, and God bless. Thanks, Daniel. I, I think it could be served in any small group. I, I see no reason that it has to be. It's just you come together and you celebrate the Lord's Supper. So. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've been in, involved with several small groups, and we have communion. There's nothing yes. wrong with that. Yes. Well, I, I tell you, thanks so much. It's been wonderful to be with you. And Terry, thank you. My pleasure. I, I just love you and appreciate it. It's nice to get back in, in this chair. <laughs> Old so times. <laughs> you and Gordon are having a great time. We are. We leave with this verse in the book of James. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. Well, for all of us, God bless you, and uh, you, you continue to watch in the 700 Club. Terry and, and Gordon are doing a fantastic job, and Lord willing, I'll be back on another one of these programs next month. See you later. Bye-bye.